Good morning, ladies. Welcome to Saturday Morning Bible Study, uh, the Kingdom-Minded Women's Bible Study. I know that every lady who joins me on here uh, is invested in the Kingdom of God. She loves Jesus and loves the church. And, well, I say that maybe you're joining me on here and you don't know if you love Jesus and you don't know if you love the church. This is still a great place for you because that's what we talk about on here is his word and how that helps us to love him more and to love others more. So whoever you are, I'm glad you're here. I am a little scatterbrained this morning. If you are new to our Bible study, or even if you're not, uh, here's a quick life update. I am um, a third grade teacher here in Springfield, Tennessee, and our school year started this past week. Wednesday was our first day with students, and so I'm three days in to the school year, and um, I w woke up at 6.30 this morning on a Saturday, even though it's my day off um, because school schedule. And I was super bummed that I got up that early because I wanted to sleep in. I did go to bed at 8.30 last night. Uh, my husband, Joseph, he said, what, you're mad that you only slept 11 hours? Did you want to sleep more? Um, <laughs> yes, I did. But getting up at 6.30 this morning, hey, Jamie, gave me uh, time to get some stuff done. So I finished up my Bible reading. I ate breakfast. Um, I'm on my second cup of coffee. Good morning, Marianne. Um, and I was just, uh, I folded a load of laundry. I didn't put it away, which is why if you do watch with me normally, I'm on the opposite end of the couch because, good morning, Lisa. Good morning, Emmy. Um, because I normally sit on the other end, but there are clothes that I folded and didn't put away. And I don't know how you guys clean your house, but I have a little bit of, a uh, attention deficit when it comes to cleaning the house. So I started, I folded all the clothes, but I didn't get them put away. And then I started vacuuming um, and I was going to town. I was vacuuming out the closet. Is the whole house vacuumed? No. I started in the bedroom and I do not normally vacuum out the closet, but you know, the attention deficit problem. Um, I was like, hmm, should probably vacuum out the closets. And then I was like, oh, I have Bible study this morning. So I looked at my phone and it was 9.58. And so I hopped on here real quick. All of that to say, I've got my Bible in front of me. I've got my notes. I used the last page in my notebook today for Bible study. So I'm gonna have to get a new notebook. I'm gonna have to use one of the notebooks I already have and not go buy a new one is the truth. Um, but I don't have my laptop. It's in my backpack and I, I didn't, I don't want to leave you guys and the laptop's not that important. It just helps me to keep up with the comments. And so, um, if you leave a very lengthy comment this morning, I won't be able to read the whole thing because I just have my phone in front of me and not my laptop. So hopefully that's okay with you guys, but I can read all your good mornings. So thank you for joining me for Saturday morning Bible study. I'm excited for this one. I'm going to say something that I say every week, but um, I think it's going to be actually true this time is that I feel like this one's going to be shorter than usual. We read kind of sporadically some from Kings, some from Chronicles, some from Isaiah, Hosea, um, and oh, Emmy, yes, I can put a note, I'll put a notebook on my wish list. Maybe someone will buy it for me. And, um, also, what else did we read? Oh, a psalm this week. We're not going to talk about all of those here today because my brain cannot handle it. Uh, we're just going to talk about Hosea. It's 14 chapters, so I do think we're going to get through this a little more quickly than usual, but no promises because I've said that before and it hasn't happened. Um, but let's do the right thing. We do the five P's of Bible study. Um, I got these five P's. I should say this from Jen Wilkins. She wrote a great book, Women of the Word, and she teaches the five books of five P's of Bible study. And that's where I got this from. But it's prayer, perspective, purpose, patience, and process. And so we want to start with prayer this morning. 
as always, if you have prayer requests, feel free to put them in the comments. We're going to start out with prayer, just praying over our Bible study. But um, I know that there are ladies who watch, and myself as well, that if you have a prayer request, we will pray for those also. So let's pray over our Bible study. When we pray over our Bible study, we pray that God would just give us wisdom to understand his word, uh, that we could grow in knowledge, and that everything we learn here would help us to love him more and to know him more and to love others more, that it wouldn't just be about us and how much knowledge we can get, but that his word would actually change our lives and that it would help us to love more. So um, let's pray this morning. I'm praying for you ladies. You pray for me as I teach and um, we'll get started. Lord, we just love you, Jesus. Thank you for an opportunity to talk about your word. It's such a gift. It's such a privilege. And we know that every time we open your word, you speak to us. And so I pray that you would just prepare our hearts to talk about your word today, God, that we would just have understanding of your word, that you would give us more wisdom. And um, I pray that as we study and as we talk together, Jesus, that we would know you more and that we would love you more as we know you more and that you would help us to love others better um, through reading your word. God, I pray that if there's anything that we've misunderstood in our study before, God, that you would correct that today. Help us to help one another. Um, and I just can't wait, Lord, to see what we'll learn about you. So I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you, ladies, for joining me. We are going to look at the book of Hosea. Let me get my notes out. It'll be easy to find the page. It's the last one. <laughs> my last page. Um, we're reading the book of Hosea, and let's just recap really quickly what's going on. We are reading um, the Bible through chronologically for our study this year. And um, we have we started with creation in the book of Genesis, and we've read all the way through to um, Kings. Now, there are a few books we haven't gotten to yet, and that's because the way the Bible is organized is not chronological. So, we have not read Ezra, Nehemiah, or Esther, um, but we've read all the books preceding those. And then we skipped over that section, and now we're in, we've read 1 Kings. Um, we're still finishing up 2 Kings. We've read 1 Chronicles, and we're still finishing up. We still have a few chapters left, I believe, of 2 Chronicles. We've read Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. And now, while we're finishing up Kings and Chronicles, we're adding in some of the major and minor prophets. And that's because the major and minor prophets, they spoke and they wrote during the time of the kings and then um, after the fall of the northern and the southern kingdom. And then things go quiet. And then we're going to pick up with the New Testament when Jesus comes. So we're getting super close to... Um, the New Testament, really, um, especially because a lot of these later books of the Old Testament are short, but some of them are really long. Isaiah's one of them. 66 chapters. It's a long one, and we only read through 38 this week, so we still have a while to go there. But let's give a little context for the book of Hosea. That's what we're talking about. And when we do our five Ps of Bible study, we've done prayer. The next would be purpose. And we kind of mentioned our purpose um, during the prayer. Our purpose in Bible study is that we would know God more, not know ourselves more, which is our tendency to read the Bible and see what we can learn about ourselves and what we should do with our lives and things like that. But um, our purpose in Bible study is what can I learn about God, his character, because when I learn about him, that affects me and how I live my life. Um, so I'm looking to see, that's my purpose. What can I learn about God here? And then the next thing that we need is perspective. And so perspective is stepping back and looking at the bigger picture when we read a book. And so if we just start reading Hosea um, from the first chapter with no context, we would think, what in the world is happening in this book? Because it's crazy, okay? But 
Hosea gives us a little context himself. And if you're reading chronologically, then this will make sense. Um, but chapter 1, verse 1 says, The word of the Lord that came to Hosea, the son of Beeri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. And so what we need to remember is that Israel, God's people, about 200 years before the book of Hosea was written, they had a major split. And 10 of the tribes split away to create the northern kingdom, Israel. And there were left two tribes, Judah and was it Benjamin? Oh my gosh, I said that, but that feels weird. I have to go back and look that up are the southern kingdom, and we call them Judah. So we have Israel is the northern kingdom with 10 of the tribes of Israel. And then the southern kingdom would be Judah. Yes, I was right. Thank you, Miriam, for confirming that. Um, Judah and Benjamin make up the southern kingdom. Um, we call that kingdom Judah. Uh, all right. And so Hosea is writing 200 years after that split. And it says that he writes in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. So that's, he writes during four kings, the lifetime of four kings or the reign of four kings in the southern kingdom of Judah. Uzziah was a good king. Jotham was a good king. Ahaz was a bad king, the worst king Judah had ever had. And then Hezekiah was a good king. And then it says he wrote during the days of Jeroboam, son of Joash, king of Israel. And um, Jeroboam was... One of... The, if not the last... I should have known this better, but where is it? In the ninth year, blah, blah, blah... Jeroboam was not the last king of Israel. Hosea was, which is really close to Hosea, which is weird, but Hosea was, but it, it's, we're coming really close to that. Um, what did it say? Jeroboam was the son of Joash. I was just looking for that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm looking for it in Kings. Jeroboam the second. Mm, I don't know. Anyways, where's my book? I need to look it up. So, either way, Hosea, while I look this up, was during the, um, written right at the end of the northern Kingdom, because this, we've talked about this before, the northern kingdom ultimately and the southern kingdom is going to fall. Um, it is going to fall. Let's see. It says, Hosea began his ministry when Israel, under Jeroboam II, was at the height of its power. Hosea would have witnessed the rapid disintegration and fall of the northern kingdom, going from its peak. Um, the height of its power under Jeroboam II all the way to its end in less than 30 years. That was something I read this year. This year, <laughs> As I studied, I did not realize that from Jeroboam II to the fall of Israel was only 30 years. They went from the height of their power, the kingdom of Israel, to their ultimate destruction in 30 years. That's how long I've been alive, 30 years. Can you imagine a whole nation going from the peak of power to their ultimate destruction in just 30 years. Usually things happen a little slower than that, but it happened pretty quickly here. All right, so that's a little background. Um, and so before Hosea came, God had sent Elijah, Elisha, Jonah, and Amos to... Um, prophesy to speak to the northern kingdom and they had not listened to any of those prophets but here now God is sending Hosea and he gives him an extremely odd task 
Um, something that we wouldn't expect God to ask of any of his children, God does to Hosea, but he has a purpose for it as God always does have a purpose. Um, and we read in chapter one, verse two, it says, when the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, go take yourself a wife of whoredom and have children of whoredom for the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. Um, Three times in one verse, it uses that word. But uh, God asked Hosea to take an adulterous wife. The ESV uses some pretty strong language there. And the reason, so some people think maybe this was just like an allegory or an illustration. But from what I read... God really did ask him to do it. Hosea really did do it. Went and took a wife, an adulterous wife. Whether she was um, living an adulterous lifestyle before she became his wife or whether he married her and then she was an adulteress as his wife is um, really unknown. But It happened. That wasn't a glitch. I like lost my train of thought. And I thought this was interesting. Something I read just to gain some perspective about this. It seems like, you know, why would God ask him to do this? What I read is that it actually would have been hard for Hosea to find a faithful wife anyways. That the lifestyle, the culture of the nation during that time... Uh, was so idolatrous and so far from what God had intended because marriage to one wife is very, uh, for life, is a Christian, is a, um, is something that God set up. And so it was in his law. And so if they're not following God, it's not, um, it shouldn't surprise us that their marriage would not be to one woman for life. That was not the way any of the other cultures of the world lived. And um, so this study that I did this week actually said that the idolatrous worship of the land was so universally accompanied by immoral practices that it was hard for a woman to be chaste. And adultery, or as the SV or KJV says, whoredom, was rampant. And so, it actually wasn't unusual. But God, what he's telling Hosea is, I'm going to take your marriage to this adulterous woman, and I'm going to use it to speak to Israel. And so, what happens, just to kind of recap, is that she is unfaithful to him, and he continually goes back, Hosea does, to redeem his wife, to buy her back. And they have children together. They have three children um, the first one is Jezreel, who was named after um, a city. And um, it's the city where Jehu, there was like this bloody battle um, for the kingdom, kingship. And so um, Jezreel, it meant that the hour of retribution and punishment has come. And so this was to the northern kingdom, and this is shortly after the northern kingdom fell to captivity to Assyria. And so um, what Hosea is speaking to the nor northern kingdom really does happen, and it happens very quickly after he tells them it's going to. Um, the next child is Lo Rahama, which means not loved. Yikes, can you imagine having that name as a child? Horrible. And then the third child was Lo Am I, which means not my people. Um, so God is really sending a strong message to Israel here. Um, we're going to kind of just leave this story that happens in chapters 1 through 3 for what it is. Because the way Hosea is written, chapters 1 through 3 are um, about him and his wife that he chooses this wife. She's unfaithful. She's adulterous. And then chapter 3, Hosea redeems his wife. You could read this as a story about Hosea and his wife, Gomer, 
Or you could replace Hosea with the Lord and Gomer with Israel, and it would be the same. It would be the same story because God used this situation with Hosea and his wife to speak and about and to his people, Israel. And that's what chapters 4 through 14 are. Um, and so we're going to look at chapters 4 through 14, but we're going to come back and look at some of these verses from chapter 1 through 3 as well. Um, so let's look at chapter 4. And there was something really confusing to me as I read this. Chapter 4, um, he keeps referring to Ephraim, which was um, one of the 12 tribes. Uh, Joseph, going all the way back to Joseph, Joseph's son was Ephraim, right? And uh, that became one of the 12 tribes. And um, I kept thinking to myself, like, I thought he was writing to Israel, but is this book, maybe it's just to Ephraim? I'm not sure. And so, upon further study, I found out that Ephraim would have been the most centrally located tribe or city in um, Israel. And it was the largest. So when he speaks to Ephraim, he's speaking to all of Israel, but he's calling them Ephraim. And um, I want to look at chapter 4, verse 1. It's really the crux of the problem here. It says, Hear the word of the Lord, O children of Israel, for the Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. Here's the problem. There is no faithfulness or steadfast love and no knowledge of God in the land. That was the main problem. And this is something that I kept seeing come up over and over again in the book of Hosea. It's what's brought up over and over again is that there is no steadfast, no faithfulness or steadfast love. And there's no knowledge of God. I actually wrote um, in, my, in the margins of my Bible, when I got to chapter 8, verse 12, it says, Were I to write for him my laws by the ten thousands, they would be regarded as a strange thing. And then verse 14, For Israel has forgotten his maker and built palaces, and Judah has multiplied fortified cities. So I will send a fire upon his cities, and it shall devour her strongholds. Two things that stood out to me over and over again through the book of Hosea and even throughout the reading in Isaiah that I did this week is that God just wanted two things. He wanted Israel to love him, to be faithful to him, and to know his law, to know his word. And I actually, when I went to write it the first time, I wrote that God wanted Israel to love his law and to know him and I was like, well, actually, shouldn't it be the opposite that we should love God and know his word? Guys, I think they're interchangeable. I think it's the same. We should love God, love his word. We should know God and know his word. The book of John in the New Testament tells us, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So when we you cannot love God without loving his word. You cannot know God without knowing his word. And that's what really stood out to me in the book of Hosea this week. And I think that is what I learned about God this week is that if I want to love him and I want to know him, I have to love his word and know his word. And that was the problem in Israel. They did not know the word of God, so they could not know their God. And we have seen this in Amos and Micah, both of those minor prophets that said that they went to the kings of Israel to speak the word of the Lord. And the kings of Israel told them, stop. We don't want to hear it. Um, let me look very quickly. I want to look up this verse. I should have written it. Uh, 
Um, in Amos chapter 7, verse 12, it says, And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go flee away to the land of Judah and eat bread there, which was another kingdom, um, the southern kingdom. But never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary and it is a temple of the kingdom. The kings of Israel did not want to hear the word of the Lord. They did not want to hear the prophecy. Chapter 2, verse of Micah, verse 5, um, or verse 6, says, Do not preach, thus they preach. One should not preach of such things. Disgrace will not overtake us. And verse 11, it says, If a man should go about in utter wind and lies, saying, I will preach to you of wine and strong strong drink, he would be the preacher for this people. So we, we've seen this in Amos. We've seen it in Micah. Now we're seeing it in Hosea. The kingdom of Israel, they do not want to even hear the word of the Lord, regardless of who it's come from. God sent Amos, they didn't want to hear it. God sending Hosea, they don't want to hear it. God's going to send Micah, they don't want to hear it. Um, and so that's a problem. That's a really big problem because um, in Hosea, let's see where it is. I wanted to read this verse. Hey, where is it? Maybe it was here. I know I read it. Maybe I read it in Isaiah. There's one book. I, it might have been in Isaiah because there is one. Oh, yeah, here it is. Um. We keep hearing this phrase in, um, and it's what it says in the ESV, in throughout the prophets, I think mostly in Isaiah, where he talks about the plumb line. And the plumb line would have been a tool to make sure that a wall was straight up and down. So it's a standard by which things are measured. And um, in Isaiah chapter 28, verse 17, he says, And I will make justice the line and righteousness the plumb line. Um, this is a huge problem with the Northern Kingdom. They don't know God's law, so they don't know Him. So there can be no justice. There can be no righteousness. And, um, which means that they have broken their end of the deal. They are not, uh, keeping up their end of the covenant. Um, God told them, if you will be my people, I will be your God. They're not being his people anymore. They don't even know him. And so, um, chapter 6 of Hosea, verse 3, says, Let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. This is Hosea begging, pleading with the kingdom of Israel to know the Lord. He's, his going out is as sure as the dawn. He will come to us as the showers... Um, as the spring rains when the water, spring rains that water the earth. And verse um, six says, For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. So you see this theme is just over and over again. What God desired of his people was never the burnt offerings, was never the traditions, was never the um, just going through the motions. He, what he wanted was steadfast love um, and knowledge of God. Um, steadfast love could also be translated there as mercy. What he wanted was mercy and knowledge of God. And that is not what is happening here. And so chapters 5 through 8 of Hosea just go over and over all of Israel's wrongdoing. It's just the proof that they do not know God, that they are not practicing justice or righteousness. And so chapter 9 tells us that Israel will be punished. And they will be punished. Chapter 9, verse 1, Rejoice not, O Israel. Exult not like the people, for you have played the whore, forsaking your God. You have loved a prostitute's wages on all threshing floors. 
Um, and so this is going back to that story of Hosea and his wife that she was adulterous. And that's exactly what Israel has been to God. They have committed spiritual adultery. And that's not uh, maybe a phrase that we use very often, but to just like to know your husband as Hosea's wife did and to go and love another is physical adultery. Spiritual adultery would be to know God and to turn to another God, to turn to an idolatrous lifestyle. So they have committed spiritual adultery. And so they're going to be punished. Uh, verse 3 of chapter 9 says, They shall not remain in the land of the Lord, but Ephraim shall return to Egypt, and they shall eat unclean food in Assyria. Captivity is coming um, for the northern kingdom of Assyria because they haven't held up their end of the covenant. And that's justice. Is If you don't hold up your end, then the deal is off there. Um, however, there is this verse, this section in chapter 11 that as I read it, broke my heart. And this is where um, our purpose in Bible study is to learn more about God. And the truth is, as humans, to me, in my humanness, I can read um, this section and be like, God, he's doing the right thing. Just letting them have their way, giving them up, letting them be taken captive. He should because he's done everything. He's given them chance after chance after chance after chance. They don't want to live for him. They don't want to know him. They don't want him to be their God. Let them go. You know, that's my flesh says that. That's um, maybe how we are sometimes with people in our lives. But any good parent, or I don't want to say any good parent, but any parent knows that um, when your child does wrong again and again and again and again, you never just want to cut them off. Or maybe as much as you want to cut them off, you just feel like you can't because you love them so much. And we see this in God and how he speaks to his people in chapter 11. And so this is a side, this is something I'm learning and seeing more clearly about God is what a father he is um, and how he made us like him. We have these feelings sometimes and it's because he has felt these feelings as well. Chapter 11, verses 8 through 10 says, How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboam? I can't say that word, but my heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my burning anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim. For I am God and not a man, the Holy One in your midst. I will not come in wrath. They shall go after the Lord. He will roar like a lion. And when he roars, his children shall come trembling from the west. They shall come trembling like birds from Egypt, like doves from the land of Assyria. And I will return them to their homes, declares the Lord. So... <laughs> This is where we see the true heart, the true nature of God, his grace and his mercy. Um, you're going to have to be punished is what he's telling Ephraim. You're going to have to be punished, but I can't punish you forever because I love you. It breaks my heart to allow you to go through this. It broke God's heart to let them go. Um but they didn't want him. And so they had to face the consequences of their actions. But he tells them, I'm going to bring you back. There will be restoration. And we've talked about this in past weeks that God is setting up. He's setting Israel up for just the greatest comeback, the greatest opportunity for restoration. Um, but they have to go through these consequences. They have to come to a place of repentance so that he can restore them. Um, chapter 13, verses 4 through 6 says, But I am the Lord your God from the land of Egypt. You know no God but me, and beside me there is no Savior. It was I who knew you in the wilderness, in the land of drought. But when they had grazed, they became full. They were filled. Their heart was lifted up. Therefore, they forgot me. So I am to them like a lion. There's that comparison again. 
Like a leopard, I will lurk beside the way. I will fall upon them like a bear robbed of her cubs. Um, so again, he's saying, you've done this before. You did this in the wilderness. You forgot about me. And so what happened in the wilderness you had to wander there for 40 years. That's what's happening again. You've forgotten about me, and so you're going to have to wander for a little while until you repent. Um, chapter 14, verse 8. Um, o Ephraim, what have I to do with idols? It is I who answer and look after you. I'm like an evergreen cypress. From me comes your fruit. Whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the upright walk in them. But transgressors stumble in them. He's telling, the, he's pleading with them in these last few chapters to repent and turn back to him. It's too late for now. There are going to be consequences. You're going to be taken captive. But if you repent, if you turn back, I will restore you. I will restore all of these things to you. And that's what happened with Hosea and his wife. If we go back to chapter 2, um, verse 14 says, Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. And there I will give her vineyards and make the valley of Achor a door of hope. And there she shall answer as in the days of her youth, as at the time when she came out of the land of Egypt. It's Hosea talking to his wife, but it's the Lord speaking to the children of Israel. You're going to wander like you did before. You're going to experience wilderness times, but I will make a door of hope. I love that. Verse 16 says, And in that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband, and no longer will you call me my Baal. For I will remove the names of Baal's other gods from her mouth, and they shall be remembered by name no more. And I will make for them a covenant on that day with the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, the creeping things of the ground. And I will abolish the bow, the sword, the war from the land. And I will make you lie down in safety. And I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. What a sweet promise and a sweet hope for the children of Israel. <coughs> God is going to provide a door of hope for them. Um, and we get to read all about it, and we get to be a part of it today. And he still does this for us in all of our wandering in the wilderness. Um, he always provides a door of hope. I wanted to read, there was one more thing that I read um, as I studied this week. Um, it talks a lot about Israel's wandering and um, this wandering began all the way back in the wilderness when they were delivered out of Egypt and then they made the golden calf and all of this stuff and they they were they didn't believe God um, for his promises of the promised land so they had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And during Hosea's lifetime and during his ministry, a, a new um, time of wandering begins um, when they're taken captive. And so their land is taken away from them and they become a nation without a homeland. And um, what I wanted to mention here is that the wandering that begins in Hosea's lifetime has continued with relentless persistence throughout all of history through centuries um, for the Jewish people um, more than any other nation. Um, it's not just biblical times, but even in modern history that they have wandered without um, a nation to call home and they've had to fight um, for a land to call home for centuries. Um, we read about God's 
covenant with his people and his relationship with the nation of Israel in the Bible, like it's history, but it's also very, it's present day, going on in present day as well, and in modern history as well, and in our lives as well, um, because we become a part of this covenant when Jesus comes and opens up the door for all of us. So, um, I guess let that speak to us today that if we find ourselves in a wilderness place in a time of wandering, um, know that what God has spoken is that all it takes is true repentance to come to a place of restoration. There is a door of hope for all of us. So I love you guys. We're going to keep trucking through this, um, through the major and minor prophets and the rest of Kings. Um, over the next few weeks. Thanks for hanging in there with me. Thanks for joining me for Bible study this morning. If there is something that stood out to you in your Bible reading, whether you're reading in Hosea in the chronological uh, plan, that's the word I was looking for, plan that I'm reading or not, if you're reading something else, I still would love to see what is it that the Lord has been speaking to you through your reading this week, be sure to leave a comment for me. What is it that you've learned? Is there anything that stood out? Is there anything that I messed up? I missed, um, I take correction for sure, um, or additions. I would love to see what is it that you've learned in your Bible study this week. Be sure to share it with me, and I'll see you guys next Saturday. Bye!